So I discovered pretty quickly that uh, the way that we broke up Romans chapter 8, uh, the way that we divided it for these short messages, today was probably an error because there is so much in these three verses today that um, we probably could have done a 15-minute homily on each one. Uh, but we will do our best to do it all in one today, and and uh, God is gracious. So um, let's start. I'll read for us Romans chapter 8, uh, 28 through 30. And we know that <clears throat> for those who love God, all things work together for good for those who are called according to his purpose. For those whom he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his son, in that he might be the firstborn among many brothers. And those whom he predestined, he also called. And those whom he called, he also justified. And those whom he justified, he also glorified. So we're going to look at, it, at several things this morning. Some of these are, are very uh, familiar scriptures to us. Um, particularly the, the first passage of Scripture that we see in, in verse 28. It's often quoted, and it is um, hopefully not misquoted. We, we tend to, to uh, misquote popular passages of Scripture. But let's look and see what it says. And we know that for those who love God, all things work together for good, for those who are called according to to his purposes. So there are a few things we need to establish and we need to to understand. Who is Paul talking to? Who has he been talking to? Uh, all throughout Romans chapter 8, uh, he has been addressing the elect of God. And he has been careful in each of his <clears throat> addresses to say, if you are in Christ, then, or if you walk according to the Spirit and not according to the flesh, then... So he is careful that he's, he's addressing those who are the elect of God. And this is ex exceedingly important for us to, to understand as we look at our different verses this morning. But what, what Paul is saying, um, and we know that for those who love God, so he's addressing the, the elect, all things work together for good. Now, something that uh, a long time ago a pastor told me is when you see something like the word all, you need to see what all encompasses. Is all just the people that the author is addressing? Is all everything or everyone? Is it, is it uh, you know, you have to, so you have to have some context. Um, and in this context, when Paul says, all things work together for the good of those who love God. Does he mean all things? That's what we have to establish. I believe that when he says all, according to the context, all things. So I want you to take a moment and reflect on, on a week in your life. Maybe it's a week when things went really well. Maybe it's a week when things went really poorly. Maybe it's a mixed bag, which most of our weeks are. And if we think about in a week where maybe we were ill, if we think about a week where something went really poorly at work, or we had fights at home, or we had physical difficulties, do we believe that all of those things work together? for the good, right? Do we believe that all those things are working together? Do we actually believe that? When something is hurtful, when we are struggling, are we able to understand that those things are working together for good? Does it feel like they're good? Likely no. When we're ill... It doesn't feel good. So this is where we need some discernment. We need some understanding. because, And we also need to continue on because it says, <clears throat> all those things work together for good for whom? For those who are called according to his purpose. Now this is an interesting thing to think about. If you and 
someone else that you know that is not a believer, someone who does not love God, have the exact same situation happen to you, can it be that the things happening in their life are not working together for their good? So these are these are kind of the thoughts that I have as I go through this and I think about it and I say, you know, God is addressing the elect. God is addressing his people. How can it be that something can happen to me for my good and the same thing happened to somebody else and it not be for their good? <clears throat> so what we need is some perspective and we need to look back at least a couple weeks into what we were discussing we talked about future glory a few weeks back right how our our current uh weight of uh, of our current afflictions uh they don't compare to the weight of glory that uh that awaits us and it's very important for us to understand that all things work together for the good of those who are called according to his purposes or his purpose so one of the big things we're going to look at in these three chapters today, or three verses, I'm sorry, <laughs> um, is this idea of God's purpose, God's will, and God's sovereignty. If we have difficulty believing that all things work together for the good of those who love God, who are called according to his purpose, if we have difficulty believing that, we have to examine what do we think of God's sovereignty? What do we think of God's goodness? Because if we are the elect of Christ, then we have to trust, one, that God knows far better than us what's good for us. My idea of what's good for me is not the same as God's idea of what's good for me. We're going to look at the word foreknew, and in, in a minute, we're going to look at it at a level of knowledge. God has an intimate level of knowledge of us that goes far beyond what we have of our own selves. God knows us because God knew us before we were made. God knew us in our, our, in, in our inception. God knows the last moment of our lives. God knows the state of our eternity. So when we have that kind of perspective, it's a little easier for us to to trust in this idea that all things can work together. But it's important that uh, that we look back to the first part, and we know that for those who love God, so the elect, God works all these things together for the good for those who are called according to His purpose. And called is the is another. Uh, word you can take that and kind of put it over in your margin because we're going to come back to that as well because this is a very important idea what paul is doing is he's circling around he's been talking about okay as christians these are the things that you can expect as christians these are the ways that you should behave and if th this is how you can identify whether you are in christ do you walk according to the spirit or do you walk according to the flesh and Paul is, is bringing this argument around to a, a, an incredible place because what he's saying is everything that happens to you is in God's hands. Everything that, that is working in your life is for your good. And if we look at verse 29, we continue on said, for those whom he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his son. And we'll stop there. So, again, he's, for those who are my elect, those who I foreknew, God has predestined, predetermined, or a, a definition of predestined, a sovereign determination in which a fixed or definite Outcome is sovereignly derived or decreed. So if, if God has, those of his elect, he has predestined for what? To be conformed into the image of his son. We've talked about this several weeks back. 
This is our aim, is that we would be conformed into the image of Christ, that we would be like Christ. This is our aim. This is our desire. Why? Because what happened when Christ died? Christ was raised. And if our desire is to be raised like Christ, then we need to be like Christ. Because it says you'll be raised up with Christ if you suffered as Christ did. So if we if we join Christ in his suffering, if we are united with Christ in spirit, if we walk according to the spirit, all things will work together for our good. And we will be conformed into the image of the Son in order that He might be the firstborn among many brothers. We Remember when we talked about being heirs with Christ? We talked about how we were joint heirs, how that the kingdom of God, we share in its glory alongside Christ. This is, this is Paul stepping us through one step at a time, looking, okay, you're going to be, you've been predestined to be conformed into the image of Christ. Why? So that you can follow him. So he can be the firstborn among many brothers so that we can stand with Christ as heirs. Well, how does that, how does that work? How does God take us who we are? We are a, a sinner in destitute. We are a sinner in rebellion against God. And he quickens our spirit. He changes our heart. The word that we put in the margin, he calls us. Now, I can remember an example. I was playing with a bunch of kids. And a storm started to come. It was a tornado. We didn't know that. But it was it was looking really bad. My mother comes out on the porch and says, Y'all come in. It's going to rain. I knew the voice of my mother. When she said, Come, I came. So I ran to the house. The other kids, they heard her. Why didn't they come? They kept playing. Because I, it was not their mother. They didn't know that voice. That call for them wasn't a, it wasn't an effectual call for them. They had to decide, I don't think I want to quit playing. I'm going to keep playing. For me, internally, I knew this is my, I, I have to go. I am drawn to this, whatever it is. I didn't even look at the sky. I didn't care that it was about to be a tornado. I didn't, I didn't know any of that. I just knew that I was called, so I answered the call. So when God issues a call, you'll hear people talk about an external call or an internal call. An external call is to say, hey, y'all come in for supper. An internal call is when you're hungry. It's, it's where you're driven by what's inside you. And for those of us who are the elect of God, this stone heart that we had has been made a heart of flesh. Our own sin is offensive to us. Our desire isn't for the things of the world. Our desire is for the things of Christ. So when God calls us, we could probably have a really wonderful discussion about when we realize God was calling us. When we, we heard this, and we knew that we were being called not just to supper, but we were being called out of our sin. We were being called to salvation. So God issues a call for his elect that is irresistible. Well, how then if, if okay, God is sovereign, and I've heard said the sovereignty of God ends where the free will of man begins, and that's heresy. It's heresy to say that God has a little bit of sovereignty. That's like being a little pregnant. You either are or you aren't. God is either sovereign or God is not sovereign. So when someone says God's sovereignty ends at my free will, that's heresy. How is it then that we can have free will? And how is it that that I can choose God Or am I just an an automaton? Am I just a robot? Well, what God changes isn't our minds. God changes our desires. God changes our affections. 
What's redeemed in us is our heart. Our desire is no longer for the things of the world. There, there are foods that I used to eat that the thought of them is repulsive today. I ate my weight in fish sticks when I was 12 years old. Today, to see a frozen fish stick, my stomach literally ties in knots. It's repulsive to me. My sin is repulsive to me. This is the call that when God changes our hearts, he doesn't say you, you no longer have free will. What God says is that you are no longer a slave to your sin. You no longer have to waller in the mud. I have made for you a holiday on the beach. So in verse 30 it says, And those whom he predestined, he also called. And those whom he called, he also justified. What is justified? We know this is a legal term. We've talked about this. We are guilty before God. Our sin makes us guilty. A little sin, a lot of sin, doesn't matter. Our sin makes us guilty before God. But when he, when we are justified, we are made right before God because Jesus covers our sin. Our righteousness is what God sees when he looks on us. He doesn't see the lawbreaker. He sees someone who meets the requirements of his law through his son. So those whom he calls, he justifies. And those whom he justified, he also glorified. So here we are. We are called by God. We are called out of our sin. We are called into his kingdom. And as we're, and after we are called, then we are justified. We are made fit for his kingdom. And then after we are made fit for his kingdom, we enter his kingdom. We enter into his glory. We can't be in the presence of God without being destroyed unless we're made capable to be so. And when we're in the presence of God, we, it's like radiation, right? We are in the presence of God. His glory permeates us as Christ's heir, uh, as, as God's heirs, as joint heirs with Christ. We share in this glory. And it's not a, it's not that God is giving away his glory. You know, God will not share his, his glory with another. It doesn't diminish God to share his glory with us or for us to glory in him, it magnifies his name. And we are the recipients of that. Think of this. How could you ever read this passage with this understanding that the elect of God are moved from a a state of destruction into being heirs of God, from being slaves to sin, to being free from sin, how can we ever look at this and understand and not desire to be a part of that kingdom? So Paul is is bringing this home as we're we're finishing up in Romans chapter 8. He is bringing all these things together for us to understand that we ought to desire to walk with God. We ought to desire to be among the elect of God. So if you're, if you're here and this seems foreign to you, this seems strange to you, but you have a desire. You have an under, you have a, a sensation. You have a, a feeling that you don't want to be a part of the kingdom of the flesh. My admonition for you today is to cry out to God. Lay your sin before God. Beg His forgiveness. Follow Christ. Believe in Christ. Turn from your sin and be saved. This chain, this golden chain of salvation as as it's referred to, this calling, this justification, this glorification, These things are of God, but we are, we're involved in them, right? This is our, we decide to follow Christ because of his changing of our heart. So my, 
my prayer would be today. Fall on your knees before God. Fall on your face before God. Repent of your sin. Turn from your sin and follow Christ. Let's pray together. Most gracious God, we we don't deserve any of this goodness. Father, we, we were enemies of your kingdom. We hated you, Father, because you stood in opposition of the kingdom that we desired for ourselves. And Father, I pray that we would understand very clearly that we have no kingdom. That we have, that we're, we're building sandcastles. And that all these things are worthless. That in you, we find worth. In you, we find purpose. And in you alone do we find salvation. Break our hearts, Father. Break our hearts for what breaks your heart. Draw us, Father, to the things that um, that are of Christ, we pray. And Lord, we praise you because you your intent is to conform your elect into the image of your Son. And this is our desire. We pray you would make it ever more our desire. And we ask for your blessing on our, on our time to come, Father, as we continue to look into uh, matters of our church and our statement of faith and, and all these things. We ask for, for your understanding as we discuss and, and look at those things. So it's in Christ's name we pray. Amen.